Hello, and welcome to another episode of Marty's Matchbox Makeovers. Today, I shall be doing a makeover on this beautiful Sentinel Steam Wagon, which is a Matchbox model of yesteryear, and it's the number Y4. And these were produced from 1956 to 1960. In the real world, the last one was built in 1934. And that last variant of this truck could cruise at 45 miles an hour or peak at 60 miles per hour, which is pretty quick for a steam engine, I'm guessing. So it had a maximum output of the engine of 110 brake horsepower, but it was only for a short burst. Now I was telling Kevin about this and he reckons he read on the internet that if you use super glue and somehow nobble the pressure relief valve on these things, you can get an extra 10 horsepower. <laughs> But uh, I'll just let him dream his dream and um, I'm going to get on with this makeover. So having a close look at this particular model, I can see that obviously it's going to need a repaint. It's going to need some new decals. And somehow I'm going to have to separate the base from the top because the chimney stack goes right through the middle of the roof. And it'd be very, very difficult to paint that without separating the model. So I'm looking at the sides, at the damage on the decals there. The wheels look in good condition. Um, on the real machine, there was two wheels on the back. And Matchbox has replicated that by making the rear wheel double the thickness. On the back there, there's a water tank, believe it or not, 120 litres of water for the steam engine to use. Underneath there, there's a couple of pistons, I think, and probably a crankshaft that drives the rear wheels. I was looking for a rivet to drill out to pull this thing apart, but there is no such thing. And I was also looking for a number, which I finally discovered right down there underneath the cabin. Very difficult to see. This is how the base is held on. It's, there is no rivet. It's basically two metal ears that have been splayed after it's been pushed together. I can't believe that this model that's over 60 years old and it's still in one piece and this is the only two little tiny pieces of metal that are holding it together over all this time. You'd think if it was dropped it would just fall apart. I can't believe that the base is so solid and I'm assuming in my mind's eye that there's like an L-shaped piece of metal at the back there and uh, you probably engage the base I'm thinking and you slide it rearwards to remove it so forwards to put it on but i've yet to work that one out so uh, hopefully all will be revealed in a minute first up i'm going to separate the front end from those little ears as i call them the splayed bits of metal and i don't want to damage the model so i've set up this little rig here where i'm going to strike it with a specialist tool that i'm about to make and hopefully separate the two halves cleanly without damaging anything and i'm a little bit nervous because if i damage it well it's gone for good and that's not my aim i want to restore this thing so it looks beautiful and new and uh, will be around for another 50 years so i've got this old oh i've got a lot of spanners in the shed i've got this old one sort of a cheap brand and i thought i'll sacrifice it for this model so I'm cutting off the tips of the jaws on one end and the other end I'm cutting off the whole the whole end. I mean I've wrecked this banner, I might as well wreck it. Do a good job of wrecking it and rather than just a half a job of wrecking it. I'm hoping to hit this with a little hammer and force this model apart. So let's have a go. And I am nervous. I don't want to wreck anything. So I close my eyes and strike it once. And thankfully everything's in one piece. But it is definitely separated. But only at the front end. So in my mind's eye, I remember, I thought that I could now move that base plate to give some clearance so I could slide that section backwards. But it's not happening I can't understand why. I've never seen anything like this. This is Matchbox magic here. It's uh, beyond my comprehension. Everything is so solid. This thing was never going to fall apart. 
So with a lot of wiggling and pushing and straining, I eventually managed to free off the base from the upper deck. And to my surprise, the only other thing that was holding it together was this tapered pin on the back, which seems very, very ordinary and not fit for purpose, but obviously it is. And um, they must have just jammed that in that hole. And because it's tapered, it just gripped for all these years. And then the, the tiny little metal tangs or ears were bent over and that fixed the model up. And that made the model sturdy. Next, I've got to take these wheels off. They're the old style axles where the ends of cramp, uh, <laughs> cramped, I'm cramped, crimped. And I'm... I wanted to reuse them, so I guess I was hopeful I would reuse them. As it is, I don't, but I thought I'd be able to remove them very carefully using this cutting disc and just grinding away the flats on the end of the axle there. And it was extremely difficult because, as you can see from the size of my thumbs in the model, it's a very tiny little model, and I'm trying to remove, like, 0.2 of a millimetre off each side of this flattened end to get the wheel off. It took me several attempts. And I just lost my concentration for a very small split second. And um, unfortunately, I've, I nicked the wheel with the disc. And I was really annoyed with myself for doing that, damaging this wheel, because I've got no replacements, and I thought, what the heck am I going to do now? How am I possibly going to recover from this? And out of desperation, I did a test where I just scuffed away at the wheel on some very, very fine emery paper. And it seemed to work, uh, and it revealed that these wheels are very, very soft metal. And this is literally in real time how much time it took me to fix it. Well, actually, I <laughs> speeded up a tiny little bit there. But um, there we go. And it's fixed. And I guess the groove that I cut in it must have been just a micron or two deep. And I managed to dodge a bullet there and get this thing looking as good as normal once again. Once painted with some dull silver paint, they should look all original again. Now, before I strip this base, I just happened to notice that there's a gold feature on the side there. So I'm just reminding myself and looking at it there to paint that little bit gold. I don't know what it is. It looks, I guess, gold. It might be a brass thing on the real, real. I must have a look at those pictures again and see if I can see that on the pictures. I didn't actually think about that before, but. That's something you might want to do, uh, rewind it and have a look at the pictures. See if you can work out what that brass or gold box was. So this is some Humbrol paint I've had around five years and I had to dilute it a bit and stir it for what seemed like ever just to get it out of the pot. And I'm painting these wheels with it and I'm thinking it's not looking that good. The finish is not natural it's not looking natural it's looking like it's brushed on it's very thick paint and I'm a bit disappointed so I decide instead I'm going to clean them off water this paint down with some mineral turps because it's oil based I'm going to use my spray brush it's a bit of uh, messing around mixing up the paint and making my spray gun dirty again but it was well worth taking the time to do it properly rather than trying to take the shortcut of using a brush for such small components. There they are. I'm quite pleased with how they turned out. And I actually give them a dust over with some Tamiya matte varnish as well, just to seal the deal. Now, as for the blue body, before I strip the paint, I'm in the habit of trying to match the paint first because in the past, in the early days, I'd strip the paint and then I think, oh my God, what color was that model? I've forgotten. And I have to scratch around in the 
bowl of floating remnants of paint, find a little piece, fish it out on a cocktail stick, and then attempt to match it. Well, this is what I do these days. I match it before I paint strip it. So I've got all these different types of blue, and um, not one is the exact match. So I have to do it the hard way and make up some special paint blend from white and blue. Now there's a golden rule as far as I'm aware that you add dark to light and not light to dark. So I started with some white and I ended up adding about half a pot of the blue to it to make the, the color, to come up with the color that I wanted. And I felt really annoyed that I'd wasted so much paint for just a small model. And I actually saved half a pot of uh, pre-mixed pre paint at the end for in case I do one of these again in the future, which I, I very much doubt, but I, I use so much paint. It, um, yeah, The base has just got to be gloss black, so I use the standard Tamiya gloss black. By the way, this is a relatively new spray gun I bought. When I say new, I bought it about four years ago because I didn't know how long they lasted for. And I was kind of future-proofing my hobby. And the other day I thought I might just break it out and give it a test run. And what I forgot was I'd use the needle, the needle in it, to replace the needle in my old spray gun. So when I opened it up there was no needle. So I had to go to the hobby shop um, and buy myself a new needle, which was quite expensive. But um, I'm very pleased the, the new spray gun seems to work equally as well as the old one. So that's it, it's a Iwata Neo. It's in the green box. They come in different colored boxes. So I got the green one. Here's a little tip I picked up from somebody a few years ago. When you're cleaning out your the bowl of your spray gun there, if you bung up the end with some tissue and then activate the air, turns the bowl into like a little washing machine and all those bubbles swirl around with the thinners you've got poured in there to clean it. It does a pretty good job of cleaning it. And then all you've got to do is remove the needle, give it a wipe down. And then afterwards, I put some extra thinners just in there. And I just dab it with tissue paper and a couple of these cotton buds. Uh, as you go, they get progressively whiter until there's absolutely no residue left in the bottom of the bowl there. Squirt some fresh thinners through it and the job is done. And that's ready for the next time I want to use it. So here's the various stages of this model, the original, paint stripped, the undercoating, and the top coating. Quite like that. Now looking at the model here, it's a very rough cast model by comparison of a modern casting. It had a very sort of sandy finish to the metal, and that is reflected in the top coat of the colour. Um, initially when I looked at it I thought there was some damage at the top of the cabin there but it turns out it's just a casting of six rivets three of them are right on the crease where the roof meets the side and it just looked like damaged or a rough casting so not too bad the base here again very sandy sort of rough casting primitive technology of the time it was the best they could come up with at such a small scale however there is a lot of detail here you can see it's chain driven the rear wheels are chain driven chain on each side large cog and there's the pistons and crankshaft i'm guessing in that center section that spins the drive cog at the front and turns the wheels i guess there's extra pipes that they couldn't cast in there that joins those pistons to the boiler at the front here which is right in front of where you sit. So I imagine this would have been great in winter driving around in that. You had that massive heater right in front of you. But in summer, I guess it would have been hell. You'd be sitting there in your, in your jocks or underpants with a, a knotted handkerchief on your head trying to stay cool. So I'm thinking now of putting this thing back together and I'm looking at the axles that I had and I've decided that they 
We went long enough to reform the ends in that original flattened manner. So I managed to find only two, mind you, axles with the same size heads on them as the original. And they were both long enough for me to trim them down and be able to squish the end again to make this look like it has never been pulled apart or I guess to the untrained eye. So how do I squash the ends over? Well, I use these little locking pliers. They have various different names for in various different countries. And what I've done with these particular ones is I've deliberately ground the teeth off of the tips. And that means I can crush things without leaving teeth marks in it. So it's perfect for reforming the end of the axle of these old style models. First off, I apply a little bit of heat from this blowtorch that I've got. And I get it red hot and I leave it to cool at room temperature. And that is called annealing and it just makes the metal a little bit more malleable and easier to deform or machine. And today I'm going to deform it. Just have to make sure I put these wheels on the right way round because if I did it the other way round, I would be stuffed because I haven't got any more rivets. Uh, sorry, I haven't got any more axles in my, in my box of the same length and diameter. So here's a nice close-up of me crushing the end of the heated axle. Obviously it's not glowing red hot at the moment because it's had time to cool down, but it is definitely softer. And when I release the pliers, you can see that it's flattened. It's now no, no longer cylindrical. It's flattened just like the original one was. I don't know how they could have done this in the factory mass producing them. I can only imagine, it's, it's such a complicated little thing, really, when you think about it, that in a factory, you got people doing this kind of thing, day in, day out, to make thousands of these things. And uh, there's a close-up of the end squashed up, and you're thinking, oh, it looks a bit ordinary, and that's what I thought. So what I do is I very, very, very carefully, again, using this little grinding disc, I just flatten the end and tidy it up a little bit to make it look more like the original. And my heart is in my mouth here because I know that I could wreck this in, a, in the bat of an eyelid. But I managed to dodge a bullet there and it's time to put the, uh, the top back on. Uh, it's very, very a lot easier putting it back together than it was pulling it apart. All I do is line up the smokestack with the hole in the roof and then engage that pin at the back and just squeeze this model together and the metal ears i guess the chassis because it's got like two long longitudinal bars or braces underneath it like the, the chassis they probably splayed when i hit it with the hammer momentarily and they didn't actually wear out or get deformed or anything and when I squash this back together with finger pressure, finger and thumb pressure, it actually holds itself together quite well. And I'm not intending to pull it apart again. So I think it's going to do. So just one last thing, I've got to put on these decals. I bought these from recovertoy.com, the uh, Australian based company. And the quality of the decals they supply in this instance, and in fact, all the time I've used them, have been very, very high quality. And just on the back there, it says modelsupplies.com. So I don't know if they buy them from that company. And hang on, wait a minute. It's actually got MMM on there too, <laughs> which of course stands for Marty's Matchbox Makeovers. So this was a special order probably they produced just for me. Probably not, I don't know. Very strange though to see that there. So I'm going to show you now how I put these decals on. A lot of fussing around here. I need like a, a paintbrush, some toothpicks, some cotton buds, wife's tweezers, <laughs> and some warm water. 
and just dunk the decals in the warm water. Now here's something I haven't done before, but people have suggested it many times, and I think it's a good idea. I just never had the pad available at the time. I've got this little sponge pad here. It's wet, and you sit the decal on the top of it whilst it's doing its stuff, separating from the backing sheet. And it means you don't have to fish it out of the water and run the risk of it folding up on itself. So that's a good little tip. I'm going to do that from now on. And then I always hold the decal and then drag the backing sheet out from underneath it. And it's very tricky when you're doing a long decal like this. If you get it fold over, if it accidentally folds over onto itself, then you might as well just screw it up and throw it away because it's almost impossible to get it back to, to, to its what it should be. And um, because of that, I'm in the habit of ordering two lots of decals whenever I order decals these days in case I stuff it up the first time around because then I'd have to put the video off on hold for another week waiting for some new decals. So anyway, I managed to get it right first time with this model. So I've actually got a spare set of these decals now to put in my decal collection and someday somebody will probably inherit those and they'll either throw them out and think what's this rubbish or they know what they are and they will use them to continue this hobby on into the future hopefully. Unless I use them of course but once I've done one of these models I don't like to do another one. I kind of feel like I've been there, done that and I, I always like to try and do a different one each time. Unless it's like a, a multiple makeover that I've done occasionally where I've given them away. But haven't done one of those for a while. I might have to do one. Now check that out. Squeegeeing out all the excess moisture very gently. Not wiping with the cotton bud, but actually rolling it. So I'm using it as a roller to squeegee out all of the excess moisture from underneath the decal there. So that the glue can do its thing. And uh, I'm happy with that. That looks really good. The one on the front was a bit fiddly. Very difficult to centralise. And uh, it was the exact right size. So there's no room for error there. And uh, it took me a while to line it up to get the sides the exact same distance from the door frame. And to get it straight, and the one on the back there had a bit of a casting down the center of the tailgate there, which I left. I'm not in the habit of filing them down like some people do. I like to see the model as it came from the manufacturer. So I, I left that there. Just tiny sort of put up a little bit of resistance for the decal there, but squeegeed it on eventually and made it work. Now the finishing touch is... The axles. It's always the axles I do last because this Molotov, Molotov, I keep thinking it's a Molotov cocktail, but it's not. It's Molotov. I think it is. The chrome paint takes a very, very long time to set or go off. And so I don't like handling the model after I've done it. So I always make sure it's the last thing I do. Okay, that model's done. I might just quickly go for a cup of tea before the grand reveal. So anyway, here's a, a quick reminder of what I started with a couple of days ago. And this is what it looks like now. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm really, really pleased with the result. And this model is <laughs> it's, it's such a simple model. It's only two parts, really, except for the wheels. But it is so detailed considering what it is. And if you compare it with the photographs at the beginning of this video, you'll see that Matchbox really took a lot of time to include a lot of details in this tiny little model, which is a very welcome addition to my ever increasing Matchbox collection. And of course, they're all, they all look brand new because I've restored them. And that is what I want. I want one of each and then I shall stop. But I don't actually think I'm going to achieve it because there's that many to do, but I shall keep soldiering on. Oh, wow, that was a heck of a heck of a job getting that done. I'll just have a quick clean up, put some tools away, a bit of tape on oh, my camera stand. Oh, I remembered the, I broke a cup. I've got to fix that cup with some super glue, so I'll probably do that now, actually, before I clean up. Loads of super 
I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Marty's Matchbox Makeovers. And if you have, please like, subscribe, leave a comment and recommend to your friends. So until next time, this is Marty from Marty's Matchbox Makeovers saying goodbye.